Hey folks, James Downs with Downs Family Boys. Uh, wanted some gar balls, so um, this video is about gar fishing, uh, gar balls with gar ball gravy, and uh, the kindness of strangers. <laughs> but uh, been wanting some gar balls for a while. We used to catch them on Sunflower River when I was a young one. And uh, we'd run trot lines out back on the back of the Sunflower River. There was a couple bins that we would set up. Uh, me and Uncle Carl would, back behind my grandmother's house. And we'd run trot lines all weekend. It caught a good bit of gar. And uh, there, back then in the Sunflower River, in the spot we fished in, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, the needle nose gar. We caught actually the wider alligator gar. Uh, Wider body, wider head, much thicker gar. But um, that's who taught me how to how to how to clean a gar and 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 how to how to fix one up and how to make gar steaks. Now, well, you can actually a lot of people make gar balls because that's what a lot of people do with the gar. But you can actually cut steaks if it's a big enough gar. And um, we used to take uh, that Montreal steak seasoning and um, put on there and, uh, you know, marinate them a little bit. And uh, we've got some stuff called some Hoover sauce we put on there. But uh, the Gar Steaks is actually pretty good too. But here's a video about the, the search of a Gar and how to make Gar balls with uh, Gar ball gravy. And uh, y'all enjoy. I, I, we had a lot of fun making this one. Y'all check it out. Yeah. You got two. You got two? Well, reel them on in. We're wearing them out today. <laughs> oh, yeah. Lay <laughs> up, Paul. Got there. Got a twofer. Got there you go. Decent size little old channel cat. Liam, you steady hauling them back and forth, ain't you, buddy? You gotta tighten the drag up a little bit, this twist one? it. This one? Other way. This one? Yep. There you go. Keep twisting until it quits singing. There you go. There you go. Now you're reeling. Let's see what we got. Oh, you doing good. You can get off before getting up. You're doing fine. Oh, there he is. I wanted two of them. Uh-oh, you got caught two again? Yep, I'm just throwing up. Oh, look at that. Now I'm Well, looking back on it, we had a good time, but we didn't catch a gar. And uh, had my hopes set up on a gar ball video, but it just didn't pan out. Looking back on it, we caught a few fish. Liam caught some brim, and uh, Allison caught some catfish, and uh, Devin caught a couple bass. Lo and behold, when we were about to finally give up, two guys next to us fishing with a bluegill under a big old bobber about two foot deep caught a gar. And I was sitting there watching them, and just like most people do, they were about to chunk this thing over on the side on the rocks and walk away and just toss this good thing away. Well, we asked if we have it, and they obliged. Well, we had spent two Saturdays in a row hunting these things down. Finally, 
thanks to the kindness of some folks that we ain't never met before a day in our life, we was about to get it. We couldn't get home fast enough. It was time to make some garb hogs. Now, I told them guys when they gave us that gar that we was going to make a video on garball, garball gravy, and the search of a gar. Well, fellas, well, this is that video. Let's get started. Now, once we got that gar home, we chunked him on the table, cleaned him up real good, and I want to thank those two fellas, too, for that free mustad six-all hook they left in his mouth. I appreciate that. I fished with it last weekend. Caught a good-sized catfish on it. Now you want to take a pair of tin snips like I got in the picture here and cut down both sides of that gar's backbone from the back of the head all the way down to the tip of the tail as close to the tail as you can get. Now you can take and cut right down the back of that head from the top of the dorsal fin all the way down to the underbelly and do the same thing on the back end on the top of that tail all the way down to the underbelly and just peel that open and take your knife and cut the meat away from the outside edge of that shell. And there's two tenderloins down each side. Now that's what you're looking for. Now because of the way YouTube's set up, we decided to go with, you know, voice over on a couple photos because wasn't sure what they was going to allow and not allow. So we did it this way and I hope it explains it good enough. Now before we get started, we're going to need two cups of gar, two cups of boiled potatoes cut up, one teaspoon of salt, a half a teaspoon of cayenne pepper, one onion, one bell pepper, and three quarter cups of breadcrumbs. Now we always use Louisiana fish fry. Comes in a yellow box. But we also gonna need a half a teaspoon of onion powder, a half a teaspoon of garlic powder, and just a dash of black pepper to finish it all off. Now once you get all your ingredients together, you wanna cut that gar up in a manageable size piece and then take your small spoon and just scrape away lightly and you'll see the soft meat separate from the connective tissue. Now you wanna take that and separate the two of them into a, uh, a container. You're gonna save the meat for later and take that connective tissue and just chunk it in the garbage. Now if you're making steaks, you wanna leave that in there and then just cut it up into good sized pieces just like you would a regular steak and uh, season it up and marinate it, do whatever you want to do to it, and leave that in there, because what it does, it adds a lot of texture to it. Now, when Uncle Carl and me went fishing, he always left his in there, and it made his garballs a little a little tougher, a little tighter than, than what I like them. I always took mine out. But um, this is how you separate the meat. Then you want to take and add your boiled potatoes. They've been cubed up and boiled. You can see the size of them right there. It makes them a little easier to mash up. So you want to take that, put it in a little separate container, and then add your gar to it. And that's your two cups of gar and then your two cups of taters right there. And after you get all that poured in there, you want to take it and just hand mash this together. Basically what you're doing is incorporating the mashed taters and the gar together. And after you get done at, at this particular step, you should have all the potatoes mashed smooth and creamy. Then you want to add in a half of your bell pepper chopped up, and really actually minced up into really, really tiny pieces, almost into a, like a juicer. And then you want to take a half of your onion and do the same thing. You want to take this and get it into as small pieces as you can. That way your garballs don't fall apart while you're cooking them. The smaller, the better. Then you want to take your breadcrumbs. Now we take just regular old generic Walmart brand breadcrumbs and you want to sprinkle all that in there over the top of it. Now you want enough to soak up the moisture and still make a decent ball. And then you want to add your salt. We use the, um, the, the bigger coarser grain salt, the sea salt. And um, I know in the recipe I said a dash of black pepper, but I like a lot more pepper than the average human being. <laughs> I like I like mine with some bite on them. Now you're going to take behind that pepper, and you're going to put in some cayenne pepper. And once again, I like mine with a little more kick. But you want to be careful right here because it's easy to add too much, and then you'll be eating all these good garballs by yourself. So you want to kind of like I'm doing, sprinkle it in a, in a cap. And that way it's a little more measurable. You can kind of look and see what you're adding in there. Now, if I was the only one eating these, I'd put about twice that much uh, cayenne pepper there in them. 
But, you know, family wants them, so I got to make them for everybody. And then you want to add you a little garlic salt and um, some onion powder. Now, we're working on something now. Now, you want to take and add these and roll them around in balls in that Louisiana fish fry. And then you want to fry them up into just little old balls. I don't want to say half the size of a golf ball, but decent sized balls and put all them to the side. And then you're going to saute your onions and your bell peppers together and you're sweating these things out and getting all them good juices out of them and softening everything up real good. Now you can see we uh we about to get them all sweated out. Everything's soft and juicy and the juices are coming out of them. It's looking good. Now we're going to add about a spoonful, big old heavy spoonful of, of just regular old flour. And then you add some water and you're making up your gravy. And you want to get that gravy good and done, completely done, and then add your garbals. Basically what you're doing is letting them sit in there and now you got you some garbals and gravy. Well, there we go. That's uh, pretty much the the how to make garbals. It's it's not a it's not a hard process. If you make salmon patties, and if you like salmon patties, and I, and, and this is what I tell people when they go garbals, because it's been considered a trash fish for so many years. I don't think people really give it the it's just due. It's a really really white meat, and it doesn't have a fish taste at all that's why a lot of people don't like salmon patties when i grew up my mom used to make salmon patties a lot when we were growing up and um loved them but they tasted like fish now you got a lot of people that don't like the strong fish flavor that's in some of the salmons you can buy and um this is a good alternative to that and you don't have that strong fish flavor but you it carries it carries over well. You can make this stuff taste like whatever you want to. Um, hard, harsh spices really do well with this. Um, we've had all kinds. We've done them Cajun. I've done them so daggum hot they bring snot to your nose, boy. And uh, we just do gar balls without the gravy when I do them like that. And we make the balls a little bit smaller, a little bit more crunchy, about half the size of a regular gar ball. And you fry them things up real good so they're crispy. Man, them little hot things are pretty good. But uh, there's a lot of different ways to cook gar. It's 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 real versatile. I, I don't know why more people don't. I guess because I guess it doesn't scale or look or clean like a regular fish that people consume, I guess. And, and I think... The size of the fish, I think here in the United States, we're, we're geared more towards a certain look of a fish. You know, we all eat catfish. You know, anybody that eats fish just about eats catfish. And you become accustomed to what the species of fish that you eat look like. That's why a lot of people, you can go to the, to the grocery store. We got a little old store down the road from us, about four miles. And um, it's just a little old tiny convenience store with one gas pump. And they have had the same can of Jack Mackerel on that shelf. It's got dust on it, and I know it's been there for two years. Because here in the Delta, you just don't, you know, a, a lot of people couldn't even point a, a mackerel out if you if you put it up on the board. What is that? I have no clue. And I think that's a lot of people just aren't, when it comes to food, they aren't up for cultural change around here. You know, they'll sit there and eat hog foot and, and pickle juice or, or boiled eggs dipped in pickle juice or smoked sausages dipped in pickle juice. They'll eat fried pig intestines, but they won't eat a gar. It, it doesn't make much sense to me, but I'm pretty sure regionally everywhere in the united states is probably like that you know they're accustomed to eating what they eat and anything outside of that realm unless you're somewhat adventurous you eat the same things every 30 days you know you got about a 30 day window where you can try different things okay i'm gonna get this today or we're gonna have that tomorrow 
And in most family households, within a 30-day span, you've ate the different things that you're going to eat for that entire month. And next month, guess what? You get to eat them same things again. Life is long, man. Try things. Go experiment. Somebody else is eating it, so it can't be too terribly bad because we've all got grocery stores, so there is a, you know, an option. But people eat these things regionally because they want to. They grew up eating it, and they enjoy eating it because it tastes good. If it didn't taste good, they wouldn't eat it. <coughs> not, in, not in today's world of, of, of fast foods and, and chicken nuggets you know, in the microwave. But uh, I guess the main thing is just, just go out and try something different. And, and this is, like I said, if, if you don't like this, you can actually take the um, canned salmon that you get at your local big box store, you know, Walmart, Target, whatever you go, go get your groceries at. They got the canned salmon. And uh, you can take this entire recipe, take out the gar, put in the salmon, there you go. You got you got yourself some store bought uh, imitation garbals, <laughs> but it, it's pretty good stuff. Just just give it a try if you can. If you catch one, keep it, clean it, cook it, and eat it. And if you don't like it, then move on about life. But but don't don't turn your nose up at it and having never tried it just because it looks like it would rip your arm off and shred it to pieces. It does not mean it's not good to eat. You know, shark's pretty good. I got an uncle that lives down in Panama City, Florida, and uh, we caught some uh, black tip reef sharks one time. And uh, he soaked them in milk. We fried them up. Pretty good stuff, but a shark will eat your arm off. So sooner or later, you know, someone said, hey, I know it'll eat me. How about I eat it this time? And, you know, it's, it's pretty good stuff. But uh, it's worth a shot. But for the fuck, I remember when I was a kid, we used to go down to Grenada Lake and there'd just be all kinds of people down there fishing. And it'd be old fellas, young fellas, little kids and everything running around out there. And I know it's summertime and it's hot, but we're going down there and it looks like there just ain't as many people as it used to be. We sat down there and uh, my grandson, I guess he reeled in probably... 30 fish, probably. But uh, between, I mean, we were catching everything from drum, catfish, caught uh, flatheads, some channels, some blues, uh, caught some really nice size brim. And uh, normally we keep the brim when we use that for catfish bait, but these things were coming out in slabs. So uh, they big enough to make a sandwich out of. <laughs> we kept all of them suckers and put them in the freezer. But it looks like more and more people are just, I guess, sitting at home, sitting on their phones, poking on the computer or playing video games. I don't know where everybody's at because according to you know what I'm hearing, there's more people in the world, so it means there should be more people out there, but it ain't. It, it seems like it's less and less, and I, I think people are getting more and more inclined to just live their lives inside their home. You know, you work, you come home, and you know, if, if you go out in the yard and do some yard work, and then you then you run back inside. When I grew up, we was out of doors. <laughs> you know, I guess it come from you know when I was growing up. You know, grandma used to throw us outside, and you didn't have nothing but a pocket full of rocks in your imagination. And uh, I think we missed that with the younger generation growing up. I do, and and it shows. It shows they have, you know a lot of them just. They're losing their imagination, their their ability to think on their feet. It's a uh, it's a different world out there from where I grew up, and uh, I just wish we could still instill some of the uh, some of the values with not just you know I hear a lot of people say get out there and go do something. Well, that's fine, but it's the ability to problem solve, think on your feet, you know create something new, you know, play in the dirt. Kids are losing that more and more nowadays. And if you got a youngin, take them fishing. It's simple. It's easy. You ain't got to keep them, throw them back. It's fun just to reel them in. You'd be surprised the number of times I go fishing 
I'll catch 15, 20 fish and not bring a one of them home. It's just peaceful. It's relaxing. The birds are chirping. The water's running. And you find a peace of mind out there. Even though it's 95 degrees and you got sweat dripping off your forehead, you can smell the water and the clouds and the birds chirping and, and, and the fish, you know, popping on top of the water and the crickets cricketing in the background or whatever that is they do. It, it's just, it, it's, a, it's a peaceful, peaceful environment. And when you go for that, it doesn't matter if fish are biting. That's just a plus. You know, I, I've had several times where I'd be sitting there just, just, you know, in my own thoughts about the world and, you know, life and, and, and where I'm at and where I'm headed and, 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 you know, folks you can help along the way. And, and you get a bite, you think, well, dang, interrupted my sock toot. So you go over there and you reel him in and, uh, Talk to him a little bit, give him a pep talk, send him on his way, send him back down the river, you know. And then sometimes you get something so daggone big, man, you get all excited. And, and those are the good days when you get something so daggone big and it goes to jerking on your pole. Nothing else in your mind matters. Everything is out. You're 100% solely focused on that one thing. You're thinking, what what knot did I tie on this? What, what pound test line am I using? And then you look down, have I got braid? Have I got mono? What am I doing here? Are there rocks on the bottom? Because I've, I've, I've reeled this thing in, you know, a hundred times and dang, I keep forgetting to redo the line on it. And you know, when did I put the line on it? And, and, and all of this stuff's going on in your head because you're focused on trying to get this fish in. You know, what hook did I have on here? You know, and I go to looking and I'm counting because I try to see which bait I was using. What did that thing bite? Because most of the time, when I get the fish in, whatever I was using for bait, I ain't on there no more. It's just the fish. But, you know, everything kind of washes away. And, and I think if you, if you learn that young and, and bring it with you when you're older, it gives you a place of peace that you can take anywhere. Anywhere. There's a body of water with fish in it close to everybody you know the the tributaries that are connected to the mississippi river stretch all over the united states and there's all kind of lakes you know little streams along the way and i'll tell you some of the best fun i had we were fly fishing in tennessee i bought a I bought a fly rod to go fishing one time because we were working at a movie theater redoing it and um got off and I seen the little stream. I said, well, let me look and just see what's in there. There was brook trout in there. I said, look at here. And you know, you see the TV commercials of guys out there just whipping that line. And I think more than catching the fish, I wanted to be able to just whip that line and that big figure eight in the middle of the air and just drop that sucker right where I wanted. We were there for about a week and a half. And I went by that stream and I was in the parking lot of the hotel. I was in the parking lot of the movie theater. And I'm just whipping that line. And then finally, with the weight on the end, the fly just the right, just the right weight, and the wind was dead still, it happened. And it, and you, it felt, you could feel it in your arm when it happened. And there it was. And I started trying to drop it. And I put a can out there in the parking lots and for two days after i figured out what i was doing i dropped that fly in that can pow pow and i thought i am a fly fisherman now baby so i go by there and uh by the little stream we got two days left before we leave and uh i'm i'm dropping that fly dead on top of the head doop, doop. and finally reeled me one in and that fish was about that long. And that was the coolest thing. That was probably, you know, I've caught flatheads that, that weigh well over 40 pounds. And and those were awesome, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. But uh, being able to drop that hook dead on top of that fish's head and reel him in, that little old fish wasn't even 12, 13 inches long. That was probably one of the coolest fish I've ever caught because 
I didn't just put a bait on a hook and chunk it out in the water and just sit and wait. You know, something will come by and get it. I had to work for that one. And uh, I learned a, a, a new respect for, for fly fishing. It's one of those things where once you get that like that massive amount, you'd be surprised how much line that is out to be able to control that much line and you be able to just doop, drop it wherever you want to. I, I found a new respect for fly fishermen. I, I really did. And that was the, the coolest little old fish I caught, I think, in my whole life. I've fought fish for 30 minutes to get them in. I've caught sharks. I've caught daggum turtles that weigh almost 200 pounds out of the river. And the coolest thing I ever caught was this little bitty fish. You know, So it, it's not always about what you catch. It, it's about the work you put into it and being out in nature. And, and and just like fly fishing, the wind's got to be right. You got to be able to feel the wind. You can almost smell it when it hits right, and then do and then drop it. It's awesome, awesome feeling. But I think we're missing that in our next generation coming up. They get so caught up in you know TikToking and 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 YouTubing and and and, and tweeting and whatever else they got going on and Instagramming and you know they're snapchatting and, and they got filters and, and all of that can be done from inside the house in the comfort of your home and in the air conditioning because man it is hot right now but and, and I understand that the convenience of being able to be connected to a group of people that you have a lot in common with that, that that's something that didn't exist when I was younger you know you had your friends and I had people who lived on my street we played every day didn't really have a whole lot in common outside of the fact that we just all owned a bicycle and we like to ride it around you know you learn to get along with people you you didn't necessarily, I don't want to say didn't care for, but didn't have a lot in common with. You know, when I was younger, you know, growing up here in the Mississippi Delta, you know, we had white friends, black friends, Mexicans. We had we had uh, a couple guys down the road. They were uh, Filipino. You know, heck, we all got along because you learn that at a younger age the people around you are still your community. You know, the people you see every day, physically see every day, they're part of your environment. You know, you intermingle with people in and out. Doesn't matter what race they are or what religion they are. We all live here. This is our hometown. And, and we all had a sense of pride about that. You know, where are you from? And, and we would say where we were from and we were proud of that. Now, you know, People want to know what 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 your chat number is, and, and and you just you know you talk to people every day, but there's someone on a on a little computer screen, you know, a thousand miles away, and you feel connected to this person, and I I know people that are emotionally invested in the conversations that they have with these people. But it's not like a neighborhood or a city or a town or a group of people that come together. You know, if, if I got a friend on Facebook and they're a thousand miles away and I've never really met this person, look, son, if my house is on fire, you ain't coming to put it out. You know, if I need you to watch, you know, my house for a little bit while me and the wife go on vacation for a couple of days, you ain't coming. You know? If your car tears down, prime example, I can't tell you how many times I have stopped on the side of the road and helped my friend's moms out because they'd be going down the road, the car go dead, it run hot, or just anything, flat tire. Just, you know, being able to actually lend a hand and help people. You can't do that if you're a thousand miles away and you're on a computer screen. Because I'm going to tell you, if you're standing there looking at that computer screen, you're looking at the version of them that they want you to see. That's not really who they are. You know, 
I'm not talking about filters and all that stuff. That 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 goes. That's a whole different conversation there. But I'm talking about the personality and the values they can, you know, perpetuate on you that they really don't have every day. You know, you're getting a version of that person, and it's going to be the best version of that person because they're not under stress. They're they're not under any kind of duress or anything like that. But uh. Anyway, I have rambled so far from a Garball video. I think those are all conversations for a different day. But anyway, grandson went home, and uh, I think he had a good time. We caught a ton of fish. He made he helped me make a few uh, YouTube videos. He tells folks he's a YouTube star. And, you know, he's fam He's YouTube famous. That's what he says. I'm YouTube famous. I'm on YouTube now. <laughs> it's hilarious. He is so cute. But uh, anyway, uh, comments. Yeah, comments. If there's anything, what, what I think I want to do next is um, we're going to tour some of the um, restaurants here in the Mississippi Delta. Um, if there's any restaurants, places to eat or anything like that that you can think of, that are either new or that have been here for a really long time that are staples of the community of the town that they were in um leave a comment in the comment box and um we're a little we we're busy we eat out a lot because we just don't have time so this would give us a chance while we're in the process of out here living life you know we've got two litters of dogs right now um, they're growing. Everybody's doing great now. They're, I, I was worried about the heat with it being so hot, but when we let them all out, they all run around. Nobody's panting but me. You know, they all seem to be quite pleasant with it, but I am not. <laughs> I go outside and I immediately start to melt. But uh, if there's anything, <laughs> anything that you can think of that uh, we can stop by, grab a bite to eat, and I'll talk to them and um, see if it's okay if we film there. And um, I think we're going to do some restaurant videos and just kind of see how that goes. But um, we're, we're gearing up towards uh, another, another trek on the Mississippi River. I think the, the, whole, the whole crew of us is, is, is looking at going down there. And uh, we'll, we should have a good time with that. But anyway, this is James Downs with Downs Family Boys. Y'all have a good one. We'll holler at y'all later.